Our first topic for this week is how Western conceptualizations of death have changed over time, based on a set of models. This will culminate in a group activity on your conceptualizations of death today. This topic provides an opportunity for us to apply the comparative framework that I introduced to you last week. Throughout this lecture, I want you to keep these metrics in the foremind, because they directly relate to some of the ideas presented here today. For today, we'll focus on Western approaches to death through time. That is, the ideas and behaviors related to death that are influenced by our cultural values, social structures, and social interactions. Through time, our conceptualizations of what makes a good death, the appropriate actions and responses to dying, and how the relationships among people have impacted their behaviors around death have shifted depending on their socioeconomic and ideological context. Luckily for us, there is a great source of information on this topic. Philippe Ariès was a French medievalist and historian of the family and childhood. His most prominent works, however, regarded the change in Western attitudes towards death that he documented in his book, The Hour of Our Death, published in 1977. Within that, he recognized four, th four themes that serve as explanatory factors for, cha our changes, for changes in our views of death over time. Those are an awareness of the individual or self, defense of society against untamed nature, belief in an afterlife, and belief in the existence of evil. Using these four themes, he was able to identify and construct five models that represent the major trends and historic reactions of, to death in Western Europe. The first of these models is what he calls the tame death during the early to middle ages in Europe, which was a time well before the age of antibiotics. As population density increased in major cities, hygienic conditions became increasingly poor, as was our understanding of health at the time. Therefore, the chances of seeing someone die were quite high. As a break in the social structure, death was viewed as a danger to the community because the loss of one of its members weakened the community's defenses against the savagery and unpredictable forces of nature. Death, therefore, had to be carefully controlled through ceremonies that served to demonstrate community and family unity with the deceased. A state of equilibrium needed to be maintained in order to contain and channel the unknown and formidable forces of nature. At this time, the afterlife was seen as a period of waiting in peace and repose for what the Church promised was the glorious resurrection and the life of the world to come. According to Arias, Death may be tamed, divested of the blind violence of natural forces, and ritualized, but it is never experienced as a neutral phenomenon. It always remains a misfortune. In the beginning, there was only one evil that had various aspects, suffering, sin, and death. The second model, the death of the self, Developed in the 11th and 12th centuries, as the sense of one's own identity prevailed over submission to the collective destiny of the community from earlier centuries. Everyone became separated from the community and the species by his growing awareness of himself, which transformed one's relationships with others and with society. This newfound individuality seeped into our conceptualization of the afterlife. Man was split into two parts a body that experienced pleasure or pain, and an immortal soul that was released by death. The body disappeared pending a resurrection, but the idea of an immortal soul, the seat of individuality, gradually spread from the 11th to the 17th century until eventually it gained almost universal acceptance. The immortal existence of one's soul expressed the individual's refusal to dissolve into some biological or social anonymity. While we see clear changes in self-awareness and beliefs of the afterlife, the remaining themes of death, that is, defense of society against untamed nature and the belief in evil, remained unchanged. At this time, there were also changes in how the community viewed and interacted with death. For example, close family members would mourn in private, and some would seclude themselves for long periods of time. The body of the deceased, too, became more concealed, because their features or condition might be upsetting or frightening. With higher death rates in Europe during the 14th and 15th century, death became a social norm again, but also a source of fear. 
Surprisingly, we also see death being vividly depicted in the iconography of various art forms, including la danse macabre, that is depicted as a procession up to the grave that embodied the saying, no matter one station in life, the, death, the dance of death unites us all. And so you can see along the bottom of your screen, people in all stations of life being accompanied to their grave by the skeletons. <clears throat> Subtle changes in our perceptions of death began after the end of the 16th century, in terms of both customs and conscious ideas, especially in the secret world of the imagination. Death ceremonies themselves became more solemn, and the body remained hidden, but where death had once been immediate, familiar, and tame, it gradually began to be violent and savage. Society's defenses against nature were cracking, and this contributed to the need for more physical separation from the dead, with cemeteries being relocated outside of cities. An early manifestation of, the modern, of, of a modern fear of death also appears for the first time, the fear of being buried alive. With that, during this period, we see that the dead body itself also becomes a source of interest. Necrophilia becomes defined for the first time as the love of the dead. Popular literature at this time also included the publication of books that documented our interests in scientific knowledge and thinking about the body in this way. For example, Dracula by Bram Stoker was published in 1897, and it demonstrates how the, the undead in the form of vampires can be a source of both fascination and take on erotic overtones. Mary, she Mary Shelley's book Frankenstein, published in 1818, illustrates the fascination with science and death. In the 19th century, the emphasis was no longer placed on the community or the individual, but the family, and this marked a major transformation in our conceptualization of death. Where previously our sense of the individual had altered between two extremes, the sense of a universal and common destiny, and the sense of a personal and specific biography, these ideas were replaced with a sense of death, sense and death of a loved one. The family replaced both the traditional community and the individual of the late Middle Ages and early modern times. The death of the other aroused a pathos that had once been repressed. Displays of mourning and grief continued to be practiced, but what the survivors mourned was no longer the fact of death, but the physical separation from the deceased. Death now ceased to be sad. It was no longer familiar and tame, as in traditional societies, but neither was it absolutely wild. It had become moving and beautiful like nature. This change in perception, however, could not have been possible without the separation of death from evil. The ancient and intimate relationship between death and physical illness, psychic pain, and sin was beginning to break down. The first barrier that fell was the belief in hell and in the connection between death and sin, or spiritual punishment. By the beginning of the 19th century, the debate in Catholic and Puritan cultures was over. Belief in hell had disappeared. At most, among Catholics, there still existed a method of purification, time and purgatory. If hell was gone, then heaven, or the afterlife, had changed too. The concept of an immortal soul was replaced with the paradise of Christians, or the astral world of spiritualists and psychics, a recreation of the best parts of life on earth, and the ability to be reunited with loved ones. The final model describes modern Western perspectives. Nowadays, complete and total privacy is the ideal. Death became dirty, and then it became medicalized and intellectualized, rather than felt. Regarding intellectualized, the Hippocratic Oath taken by those in the medical field states they will save life at all costs, so that life is valued and prioritized. But doing that somewhat denies the process of dying, especially when it comes to some ethically sketchy stuff. Improvements in, in hospitals have led to a lack of familiarity with death, as medical professionals typically care for the dying and are physically present in death rather than someone's loved ones. Improvements in medical care and life expectancy mean that death is a rare occurrence and less experienced for the living. According to Arias, the seriousness of illness is denied to protect the dying person from his or her own emotions, so people are forbidden to mourn their own death as they're dying. We often talk instead of fighting death, but there really isn't any talk of accepting death. Even after death has occurred, 
death is denied. There's anxiety around touching the corpse, so it is embalmed and sealed in a casket to protect it from decay. The funeral rites have become very simplified. We no longer see wakes. Visitations are usually limited to just one day, and the ceremonies themselves are very standardized. Grave markers, too, have become much more simplified in recent times. The community feels less and less involved in the death of one of its members. First, because it no longer thinks it necessary to defend itself against a nature which has been domesticated by the advance of technology, but also because it no longer has a sufficient sense of solidarity. The community, in the traditional sense of the word, no longer exists. It has been replaced by an enormous mass of individuals. <laughs>